Red Cave Podcast. Reading tonight from Tales from the Cracks, numbers 27 through 32. Starting with Why Not Robots, followed by Death Doesn't Take a Break, Cell Sleeper, The Pyrotechnic, and concluded with Crimson Creek is Dead. They are not long, the weeping and the laughter, love and desire and hate. I think they have no portion in us after we pass the gate. They are not long, the days of wine and roses, out of a misty dream. Our path emerges for a while, then closes within a dream. Ernest Dowson Why not robots? Tanner, 36, sits in a lunchroom alone with a sandwich. She's wiping her eyes with a napkin when Will, 25, walks through the door holding a cooler. He smiles at Tanner and opens the fridge. Hello? Hello there. Will opens the cooler and starts stocking the fridge with bottled drinks. Can I help you? I'll get out of your hair in a minute. And you are? I'm Will. And you? Tanner. But that's not what I meant. I mean, what are you doing? Do you work here or something? Nope. I'm guessing you do? I'm on my lunch break. Looks like you need something to drink. He hands her a bottle and she inspects the label. What is it? It's a new soda. Electrade? Yeah, I represent the company. I go around giving people free samples, you know, to get them talking. And you're stocking our break room fridge? Why? Well, this is a restaurant. Electrade would love to be on your menu, so I thought I'd get your attention. Did you talk to anyone up front? No. You just wandered back here. I don't wander. I don't think you're supposed to be here. Well, I'm gone, actually. Keep that. It's on the house. I don't want it. Thank you, though. No, really. Try it. It'll make you feel better. I can see you're a little under the weather. I'm fine. Looks like you've been crying. Shit. Like you care? I care enough. I hate to see when this happens. See what? The working class sickness. You got it, right? You hate your job. I get it. Where'd that come from? I don't hate my job. Listen, it's alright. I understand perfectly. I don't hate my job. Of course not. A waitress makes decent money. I wash dishes. You get a lot of fulfillment from that? I'm not ashamed of what I do. Didn't mean to offend, I'm making a simple observation. A woman is on her lunch break with an unopened sandwich crying into a napkin. It's okay if you hate your job. A lot of people do. That's not why I was... Just forget it. It's your boss, isn't it? Can't you take a hint? He doesn't understand. I do. Will takes a seat. I need to get back to work. Tanner stands up. Have you ever thought of quitting? Thanks for the drink, but no thanks. I can get you a new job if you want. Much better than this one. What, passing out samples of Electrade? Yes and no. You'd be delivering it, making deals, partnerships, advertising, that sort of thing. You're serious. I was once like you, at a dead-end job, working for a boss that didn't respect me. I was a grocery bagger at a supermarket. Mind-numbing work, believe me. I didn't get any enjoyment out of it, so I do it. Tanner sits back down. For money? No, I don't need money and neither do you. Money is slavery, pure and simple. Without money, you're out on the street. I'm not living out on the street and I don't have a penny to my name. What are you talking about? You have a job. You work for Electrade? Technically I do, but I don't get paid for my work. I wouldn't take money even if it was offered. That doesn't make sense. I represent a large group of people who do have money. I do them services and they take care of me. They give me a nice home and provide me with food. You don't have any money on you? No bank account? I used to. I don't have a social security number or an ID. I dropped off the grid long ago. How is that possible? How can you work or even live without an ID? I'm well taken care of. An Electrade gives you all these handouts? For what? For recruiting other people, inviting them to come work for us. And don't confuse food and shelter as handouts. I do many things for my group. I'm an electrician, for example. I do odd jobs around the farm whenever I'm needed. Wait, a farm? You live on a farm? Yes, that's where we bottle the drink, but I think of it as a city within a farm, a community of a few hundred people. All the employees live there, and we don't trade money, only tasks and services. And everything is taken care of. We have farmers tending crops, teachers, doctors, architects, butchers, chefs, and the list goes on and on. And none of them are paid? No, they practice what they love, and that's reward enough. Every person has something he's willing to do for free. What about the lower jobs, like clerks or waiters or dishwashers? Yeah, who works those? No one. Robots are doing those jobs. You're kidding me. Why not robots? More than half of Americans have service jobs, and it's so unnecessary. Our shops are all run on computers, and everything is brought out to you on a conveyor belt. 
Goodbye, lower and middle classes. Robots take out our trash. Robots service our cars. Think about it. How can you afford that? Like I said, Electrade has a lot of money. They also have a lot of friends. There's no way this place could exist. I would have heard about it. The government knows about us, sure, but they don't want others to know. We're a threat, but not a huge one. Yet. There were communes in the 60s where hippies lived off the land. It never lasted, though. Where others fail, we'll succeed. Tell me, Tanner, what do you like to do, even if you aren't paid for it? I like poetry, but that's not important. Not compared to food or electricity. We have many writers on the farm. The same goes for musicians or actors. We still need entertainment. Actually, my group has a mantra they recite daily. I think you'd like it. You want to hear? She shrugs her shoulders. Closing your eyes is the biggest of sins, where the work is too much like a shot to the chin. Your home and your kids are walking on pins. Now walk into heaven. Where the hell have you been? That's your mantra. We all have it memorized. Maybe you could write us a new one. I couldn't. Why can't you be a poet? It's too hard to make a living. Do you enjoy your job here? If you're asking me if I'd rather be a writer, yes, I would, but I need to be realistic. I guess the dream kind of fell away. You could still be a writer, just quit this job. I couldn't do that, I need to provide for myself. Do you have a husband? Any kids? Just me. So what do you work for? Are you saving up for something? Only enough to scrape by. That's no way to live. It's, it's work. This is how it is. This is suffering. It's all I have. And it's nothing, nothing at all. I've been out on my own since I was 17. This is the real world. Why defend something you hate? I don't hate. Is this how you want to live? Waiting, hoping, hoping, waiting. I have, this isn't my problem. I have to go. You have nowhere to go. If you leave this room, the lunch break is over and then it's back to work. I don't hate my job. Just stop it. I, I, she puts her face in her hands and erupts into a coughing fit. He cracks open her drink and passes it to her. She waves it away. Drink it. No, come on. She takes it, but doesn't drink. We can help you, Tanner. No, you can't. I can give you a business card right now. Call the number and you'll have a job tomorrow. No question. The only catch is that there's no money. In time, you'll learn to give up all this. You'll never look back. He hands her a business card and she reads it slowly. Don't you think you should at least try the product? She looks at him and then at the bottle. She takes a drink and puckers her lips. It's okay. I'm glad you like it. It's going to be big. This is how you fund your farm town, isn't it? You sell millions of bottles of this stuff? No, we haven't sold one bottle. It's going to be a free drink. That's insane. It doesn't work without profit. This world is run on money. People love money. No, people hate money. They just don't realize it. I don't hate money. See, if anything's going to change for the better, people have to stop pretending. This job and its paychecks have done nothing for you. Neither did your allowance as a kid. It's all material garbage. This is how it's always been. The monetary system was around long before us and long after us too. I hope not. If we want a revolution, we need a revolution of consciousness, like an electric shock to the system. We need a new drug. We all saw how LSD changed the 60s. If every person on this planet would only take one hit of LSD, then we would have a fighting chance. We could put it in the drinking water if it was manageable. Sounds like manipulation. Isn't that what Charles Manson did? Yes, but he did it for all the wrong reasons. We're trying to liberate the world, educate the people. What I'm saying is that the 60s failed big time. They were just a bunch of stupid kids who sobered up, cut their hair, and got a fucking job already. That was the crime. They lost their spirit. The drug wore off. What this planet needs is another ice age. Nah, there's a better way. Everyone should just quit their job. It's as simple as that. Sounds crazy. Tanner's head droops and rolls from side to side on her neck. Her mouth is hanging open comically. So, what'd your boss do to make you cry? I... I asked for more hours. I can barely afford bread. He said no. Things are tight. Things are tight. He doesn't deserve you. You work your hands raw in that soapy water. I... I wonder sometimes why I worry. None of it matters. All we do is worry. And... and... for nothing. Will takes her bottle and recaps it. He places it into his cooler. Do you hate your job, Tanner? She nods her head. Do you want to come to the farm with me today and meet my friends? They'd love to meet you. She nods again. Are you going to quit? She begins to take off her uniform, unbuttoning her shirt very slowly, revealing a white tank top underneath. She drapes the shirt over the tabletop, gently smoothing it flat. Will helps her up and leads her out the door. I have this poem. You want to hear it? I'd love to. Okay. Knock, knock. They both leave the room. A second later, a man enters wearing the same uniform as Tanner. He opens the fridge, pauses, and selects one of the bottles. He inspects the label and unscrews the cap. Death doesn't take a break. 
Fade in. Exterior. Cornfield. Day. Death struggles through a field of corn on a sunny afternoon. Every stalk he touches with his hands withers and bends like a burning match. He emerges on the other side covered in hairy seeds, decorating his black cloak in an adornment of white snowflakes. He has sharp cheekbones and thin white stained lips that peel into a grimace. Death lifts his gnarled hands to crack his knuckles. His skin is paler than the white corn. His every vein stands out as a complicated road map on his flesh. His gray eyes rest upon a farmhouse. It is narrow but tall. There are far too many windows on the front to be considered useful. Every single one glints in the healthy sunlight. Exterior farmhouse. Day. A farmer chops wood outside. He coughs into his hands, which are already stained red with his blood. He sweats profusely and his clothes hang loosely from his thin frame. He notices death and shades his brow with his hands. He does not move. He only stands there with his axe. Death lifts his hands as if to wave, but leaves them at chest level. They reach out toward the farmer as he walks closer. He starts to pick up his pace. The farmer suddenly lifts his axe and swings it wildly to fend off the man in black. Death pauses a few feet away, his hands still upraised. The farmer backs away slowly, and he brandishes his weapon. Death remains where he is. He waits for the man to turn around to run before chasing after him. And when he gets his chance, he trips over a pile of wood and sprawls out onto his chest. He cranes his neck and watches as the farmer retreats into the corn. Death's eyes grow red and the corn immediately catches fire. The farmer coughs and screams for help. Death stands up and brushes himself off. He smiles. Then the farmer fumbles out of the crop, his jacket alight. He runs into the farmhouse and there are loud bangs and clangs from inside. A woman screams, followed by a dog bark and a baby's cry. Death walks up to the window and sees that the kitchen is on fire. A gas lamp in the corner explodes and the windows blow out in a spray of glass. Death cowers against the side of the house, while stacks of smoke lick out into the air. He hears a voice and looks up. A woman with a blue bonnet pokes her head out of the upstairs window. She coughs and sputters through her tears. She spots Death and yells down at him. She disappears and reappears with a baby in her arms. She holds him out as if to drop him. Death shakes his head and holds out his palms to stop her. She pleads, her face full of tears. Death looks at his naked hands and then back up at the woman. He holds up one finger and sprints away into a nearby tool shed. Interior, tool shed, day. He bursts inside and rips through the cabinets. He finds a pair of gardening gloves on the wall and straps them on. Exterior, farmhouse, day. Back outside, the house is already charred black on one side. Smoke consumes the sky. Part of the roof is caved in. The woman is still half in and out of the window, and her baby screams. She appears drowsy, as though she could easily fall out of the window, baby and all. Death calls for her, and she gratefully drops the baby into his arms. He takes the baby to a wheelbarrow and returns to the foot of her window. He motions for her to jump, but she holds up a large dog instead. He shakes his head, but she drops the animal anyway. It lands on his back, and they hit the grass together. The dog bites into his arms and makes its way up to his shoulder. Death screams and attempts to push the dog away. The dog grabs a good piece of his cloak and rips it to tatters. Now Death's gangly legs are completely naked. They kick in the grass. Finally, Death sucks in a lung full of air, and with his eyes a deep red, he summons the loudest unholy bark that he can muster, his yellow teeth bared. Without a moment's hesitation, the dog takes off into the fiery corn, its head low. It does not look back. Death stands up, tattered, his arm covered in blood and his breath ragged. He looks up and the woman is gone. What has replaced her is a tongue of fire, licking at the underside of the roof. She appears in another window and she is in the process of climbing out of it. Death runs to catch her, but realizes that the dog had torn off one of his gloves. His ghost face retracts back into his skull and his eyes pop. He scrambles in the grass on his hands and knees to find it, but there is nothing. The woman is on the windowsill, just ready to scoot off. Again, he motions for her to wait as he sprints back to the shed. The fire has now ravaged the shed into a hothouse. He puts his hood up and ducks into the bright inferno. He returns with his skin blackened with soot and his clothing reduced to smoking rags. He has a large ladder tucked under one of his arms. He props it up against the side of the house and allows for the woman to climb down. Once safely on the ground, she tries to hug him, but he pulls away, his hands behind his back. She thanks him before going to check on her baby. Death stands in place for a long moment as the house collapses in a final spray of ash and cinders. Now there is a perfect view of the field as it burns. There is a loud click. 
The farmer is standing behind him with a two-barrel shotgun. He is very badly burned and his clothes hang off him in charred strands. He scowls and fires. With super speed, death ducks low on his hands and knees. He crawls toward the farmer like a determined spider. Death bounds to his feet and snags the weapon from the farmer's hands. The farmer falls onto his back and cowers into a ball. Death tosses the gun aside and stands over the man. He wears no expression whatsoever. His naked hand unclenches and reaches out to touch the farmer's brow. Then he stops and turns around. The woman and her baby are only a few feet away. She is frozen. The baby clings tight around her neck. He turns back and his jaw drops in slow motion. His sponge-like tongue shrivels away into his throat. The farmer has reclaimed his shotgun and has it aimed to blow Death's head off his shoulders. Just as the farmer fires, Death fades into nothing. The woman's bonnet flies off her head and lands in the grass. A large bullet hole has tagged the fabric. Exterior forest, day. Death materializes amid a group of trees and he sits on his heels against a tree trunk. His arms hang between his knees. He exhales and closes his eyes. A long bead of sweat begins to crawl down the curves of his face as he wipes it away with the back of his hand. He crumples to the earth in a lifeless heap. Fade out. Cell Sleeper Simon is a prisoner at a correctional facility going on five years. He has been convicted of tax fraud and has two more years in his sentence, one with good behavior. We meet Simon during visiting hours, but he is sitting alone. This is not strange to him. He figures that his long estranged girlfriend set the appointment, trying to muster the courage to see him, but she never follows through with the visitation. He sits and waits, listening to some commotion down the row of booths. A prisoner and his wife are arguing loudly. The man storms away and leaves the woman alone. She walks off distressed, but notices Simon's empty booth and joins him. She introduces herself as Sarah, and she is strangely familiar to Simon. She describes her shaky relationship with her husband, Lance, and that he will be released from prison very soon. She has been pushing for a divorce for some time, and he has refused. She fears for her life now that he will soon be released. She asks Simon if he knows her husband, and he says yes, they are only a few cells apart. She wants to know everything he knows about Lance, which isn't a lot. Simon returns to his cell, noticeably changed by his interaction with Sarah. A few days later, Simon receives another visitation request and finds Sarah waiting to speak with him. Simon says that she is familiar, and that he can't get her out of his head. She admits to the same thing. The conversation comes back to Sarah's husband. She asks the important question, will he kill her husband for her? Right away, he refuses even though he has intimate feelings for the girl. She offers him money, but he walks off. They continue to meet each other over the next few days. Sarah never mentions her proposition again. During their meetings, they talk about Simon's release in under a year and the new life they will start together. Simon meets Sarah's husband, Lance, in the gym and seriously thinks about murder. Without Lance, Simon's life with Sarah would be much less complicated. He doesn't go through with it, but starts planning the perfect murder. Simon meets Sarah during visiting hours, but notices that Lance is there as well, sitting at an empty booth a few rows away. Lance spots the two of them together and reacts with hostility. Sarah bolts, and Simon returns to a cell, now fearing for his life. Simon prepares to defend himself, and he uses his group of friends as protection. They march outside into the courtyard for recreation, and his friends betray him, swayed under the influence of Lance and his gang. Simon is now left alone, and Lance appears out of the crowd of people, wielding a knife. Simon screams, and Lance disappears before his eyes. No one else sees it, but Lance is gone. Simon is afraid that he is losing his grip. No one seems to care that Lance has disappeared. Lance's cell is occupied again, and whenever Simon mentions Lance's name to someone, he receives a confused stare. It is as if Lance never existed at all. Worse yet, Sarah has not come to visit him, and he worries for her safety. Maybe Lance was released, after all, and found her. After the altercation with Lance, Simon notices little inconsistencies in his day-to-day. -day. He explains this all to the prison shrink, Dr. LeBarge. One second it's daylight, and the next it's night. He experiences large memory gaps in time, almost like a dream. Simon tells Dr. LeBarge exactly that. He believes he is in a dream. Why else would Lance disappear right in front of him? How else could he explain all the weird reality flaws? Simon can't remember what crime he committed anymore. He can't even remember the name of his old girlfriend. He can only think of Sarah. All Simon wants to do is wake up, but can't figure out how. 
The doctor proposes that he is suicidal and that waking up is another way of killing oneself. Simon realizes that he may be right. The only way to wake up is to die. The doctor puts him on suicide watch and a guard stands in front of his cell all night. That night, Simon dreams that he can walk right out of his cell. After waking, he takes it as a sign to finally embrace his dream reality. As a test, he disappears the guard outside his cell. Simon then walks through his cell door like a ghost and transports himself to Sarah's house. He knows he is in a dream and that Sarah may not be real, but he wants to confront her one last time. He finds her at her house, and she pulls a gun on him, frightful of his intrusion into her home. He tries to console her, telling her that Lance is dead, but she already knows this. He wonders how, and then figures it out. She scheduled a visitation with both Simon and Lance at the same time. This way, Lance would see them together and try to kill Simon. Simon would either have to kill or be killed. Simon is angered at being used and moves to attack her. Thinking that he is invincible in his dream world, she shoots him in the head and he dies. Simon wakes up in a hospital bed, connected to wires and other medical instruments. Dr. Labarge hovers over him, dressed in white surgical gear. The other medical professionals in the room are distressed that Simon is awake, and they strip him of all his tubes and appendages. Disoriented, Simon looks around the room, which is just a cupboard, barely bigger than a prison cell. As he sits up, Labarge explains everything to him. Simon has been sentenced to life imprisonment for murder. He was charged of killing a woman named Sarah. Simon does not remember this and refuses to believe it. Labarge says that memory loss is common and it should return in time. This is the future, and incarceration is a little different. To avoid overcrowded prisons and prison violence, all prisoners are now put to sleep for the entirety of their sentence and are provided with a dream framework to live in, where they may go about normal lives in a hyper-real dream world. Labarge insists that this is much more humane for the prisoner, where even a criminal is able to live a full, meaningful life. But sometimes the sleepers wake up too early, like Simon. Sarah, Lance, and everything else had been a dream, structured to distract him while he did his time. Simon tells the doctor that he was in prison, even in the dream world, and Labarge says that is common for the sleeping prisoner to fall into his same destructive patterns. Now that Simon is awake, it is impossible to put him back to sleep, so they take him to the Waker's Barracks, where all the waking prisoners are sent. The barracks are cold and sterile. Simon is given his own cell the size of a cupboard. There are no human guards in the barracks. Everything is run on machine. Robots bring him his meals, and he eats right there in his cell. He never sees the other prisoners, but the cells are so close he can hear them talking to each other. Simon tells them his story. He is now torn between two realities. He refuses to believe that he could have killed Sarah, especially when it was her that shot him. He assures himself that he is part of some conspiracy. The dream world was the true reality, and someone must have drugged him. He decides that Labarge is behind it all. Simon hallucinated Lance's disappearance and every other inconsistency. After being shot, he was taken to this horrible prison to die. He was framed for Sarah's murder, probably to protect her. She is the true criminal. The prisoner in the next cell strikes up a relationship with Simon. He tells Simon he is wrong. The prison is just another dream. The prisoners in the barracks believe they are one step closer to discovering the true reality. But the only way to move on from this dream is to die. The prisoners are all staging a mass suicide now that they have the proper weapon. The first day of every month, the prisoners are moved from their cells to go outside while their cells are cleaned. There, in the courtyard, they will murder each other and move on to the next reality. Simon is horrified by this idea, knowing that he will likely be killed whether he agrees to their philosophy or not. The barge sends for him, and they meet in an office. He follows up, asking Simon if he remembers anything about Sarah. Simon is still confident that he did not murder her and demands to be set free. He tells Labarge about the other prisoners and their plot to kill each other. Labarge shows no concern. Labarge asks him if he believes he is in a dream. Simon says no. Everything seems too real, and he does not want to die. Simon begs for protection from the prisoners, but Labarge won't help him until he realizes the reality of his crime. He must admit that he killed Sarah. Simon still refuses to believe it. He is sent back to his cell, defeated. Later, Simon's next-door neighbor strikes up a new conversation. He finally tells him his name is Lance. Simon is shocked and wonders if it is the same Lance that was married to Sarah. Lance tells him the whole story. He was married to a woman named Sarah, whom he learned was having an affair with a guy named Simon. Lance caught the two of them together in bed and attacked Simon. There was a scuffle, and in the confusion, Sarah was killed, seemingly by both of them. As Lance tried to revive his dead wife, Simon ran, later to be picked up by the police. 
A few months later, Lance was picked up for also killing Sarah, landing him in the same prison as Simon. Simon is shaken by this news, but does not have the memory to prove the story, but that night he has several strange dreams of the scuffle with Lance and Sarah. He meets with Labarge and mentions the dreams. Labarge confirms that Simon is ready to know the truth. The doctor plays a tape recording of Simon's voice. It is Simon's confession to the crime. Every prisoner records his confession before going to sleep to preserve the memories they will lose. Simon is shocked to hear the entire story. His affair with Sarah lasted for some time, but Sarah was hesitant to break off her marriage with Lance. Simon decided he needed to act. He set up a scenario where Lance would find out about their affair. Lance would then divorce Sarah and allow them to be together. The plan backfired and Lance discovered both of them in bed. Labarge stops the tape before it can finish and Simon wonders why. Still, Simon admits to his crimes and Labarge offers to help him. He will not release the prisoners from their cells. The first day of the month, all the prisoners are preparing for their end, but they aren't released. The prisoners react with anger. There is a large-scale prison riot in the barracks and all the prisoners escape. Lance opens Simon's cell and drags him out. They all march into a courtyard where a single weapon, a kitchen knife, is passed around. Simon held against his will, they set up for the ritual. Lance appoints himself as the executioner and takes volunteers. After all the prisoners are dead, he brings the knife to Simon's throat. It is then that he recognizes him as the man who killed his wife, and he reacts with new hatred. Simon pauses and reminds himself that he is in a dream. Sarah never really existed, and neither does Lance. He tells Simon that there's no harm done and offers Simon the knife. Simon seriously considers it, but decides not to kill Lance. Lance smiles and then slits his own throat right in front of him. Simon is left alone in the courtyard of bodies. After almost dying, he knows he is in reality. Labarge finds Simon and they return to the doctor's office. Simon is so traumatized that Labarge gives him some medication and tells him to lie down. Before slipping into sleep, Labarge plays him the rest of the taped confession. Simon's voice explains that Lance later killed himself after his wife died. This means that Lance never made it to the prison and therefore never died in the courtyard. As Simon puzzles over this, the doctor tells him he can wake up. Simon wakes up in a psychiatrist's office with Labarge. The doctor tells him that he has successfully passed the procedure and is ready to return to society. He explains the exercise. This is still the future, but criminals are not locked up. They are brought to a psychiatrist who puts them under a deep hypnosis. He takes them through different levels of dream reality where the patient must realize the error of his crime. In Simon's case, he accidentally murdered his lover, Sarah. The doctor had guided him into the first reality, where the roles had been reversed. Instead of killing Sarah, she had killed him. This way, the patient can experience his own crime from the victim's point of view. In the second reality, Simon had to confront the reality of his crime. He had to honestly admit to what he did and recognize the dream as truth, which Simon did. Also, when given the option of finally murdering the man that caused Sarah's death, he had refused, completing the procedure. Simon had only been under hypnosis for an hour, and is completely rehabilitated. Now he is ready to return to his normal life, but his memory of the crime will have to be cleared. He will now go out into the world as a blank slate, but will still carry all that he learned in his subconscious. Simon is put under hypnosis once more and wakes up a new man. We meet Simon one last time, sitting down at a coffee shop. He is reading the newspaper when a woman walks in through the door. We recognize her as Sarah. Simon is infatuated with her right away, and they make eye contact. She smiles at him, and he smiles back. The Pyrotechnic Mountain Hill High School, Nevada, mid-afternoon. Stephen Cook, a naive man, about 25 years old, guards the school entrance. He had been a security officer at the school for about three years now. He actually enjoys his job and co-workers. A teenage boy walks through the front door with a large duffel bag. Stephen, hey, you need a sign-in, kid. The boy pulls out a semi-automatic gun from the duffel bag and aims it at Stephen. Stephen, whoa! Stephen puts his hands up into feet and flames shoot from his hands and ignite the boy. Stephen stares in stunned silence as the boy rolls on the floor in a futile attempt to put out the flames. The school police officer runs up, yelling into his radio. Officer, I've got an active shooter at the high school. To Stephen, are you alright? Stephen can't say anything and just stares at his own hands in amazement. Stephen sits at his table in his apartment, reading the newspaper. The headlines read, Local security guard saves school, powers, and... Fellow employee alleges seeing flames shoot from hands. Stephen attempts to release his powers again, staring at his hands until his finger ignites like a match. He attempts to control it, but the flame gets too large and the smoke alarm goes off. The flame then disappears. There's a knock at the door. 
Landlord, through the door. Steve, I heard the smoke alarm go off. Is everything okay? Stephen, yeah, sorry, my oatmeal was burning on the stove. Landlord, oh, all right, begins to leave but turns around. Is it true? Stephen, what, the powers thing? Landlord, yeah, forget it, turns and leaves. Stephen, to himself, what am I supposed to do with this? He holds his head in his hands when the phone rings. Stephen picks up the receiver. Hello? Tom Lynch. Stephen, what's going on? This is you in the paper, right? Stephen. Oh, Tom, I'm glad it's you. Tom. I've known you for nine years and you don't tell me you have these... Stalls then whispers. Powers. Stephen. That's because I didn't know until now either. Tom. Yeah, well, a lot of people are talking about you being some kind of hero. Stephen. I'm not a hero. I don't want to be a hero. I can't be one. Tom. But you have a gift. You need to use it. Stephen. I can't even control this. How can I use it to be a hero? Tom. Use it? He is cut off by a knock at the door. Stephen. Look, I gotta go. He hangs up the phone and answers the door, where a distraught older woman is standing. His neighbor, Jill, breathing heavily. There's been a bank robbery down the street. Two policemen have been shot. You have to hurry. Stephen. What do you think I can do about it? Jill. There's no one else. You have the powers. Hurry. Stephen. Murmuring to himself thoughtfully. Use it. That's what Tom said. Use it. Stephen arrives at the bank where police are huddled behind the doors of their cars. One of the bank windows is shot out and the robbers continue shooting. Stephen holds up his hands. Come on, come on. Sheriff, oh no, get back, get back. The robbers look over at Stephen and soon he is looking down the barrels of their guns. When an officer fires his weapon, Stephen is startled and to his surprise, fire comes out of his hands. In a brilliant flash of heat, the bank is lost behind a blanket of burning light. Stephen stumbles backwards, staring at his hands. He looks back at the bank and sees it is burning like a torch. The robbers are no longer in sight. Ten minutes later, firefighters are still struggling to put out the burning building, while Steve is inside a circle of reporters and police. Reporter 1. How did you do it? Sticking a microphone in his face. Stephen. Well, I... Reporter 2. So are you Nevada's new hero? Stephen. I don't... Reporter 3. Is this some new special effect? An urge for publicity? Stephen. No, I... Well, I... Sheriff. Everyone back, let him through. Back! Sheriff pulls Stephen through the crowd of reporters until he is safely next to the sheriff's parked cruiser. Sheriff. That was quite some quick thinking, son. Hands Stephen a bottle of water, which he takes reluctantly. Stephen. Thank you. Sheriff. Some power you have there. Extraordinary for that matter. Stephen. I didn't mean for it to go that far. Sheriff. No, they would have turned you into Swiss cheese. You did the best you could. Say, we could use someone like you on the force. An hour and a half later, he stops at a gas station. He fills his tank and notices a woman and her son staring and pointing at him with fearful eyes. Without a word, Stephen gets into his car and continues down the desert road. He switches on the radio to calm his nerves and an announcer comes on. Announcer. Stop the robbery by setting the bank on fire. Can you believe this, Gale? If you ask me, this guy's a menace. I mean, Stephen shuts off the radio, sighing angrily and white-knuckling the steering wheel. He decides to turn off on a desolate dirt road that stretches the length of the Nevada desert. After another two hours of driving, his car coughs and jolts to a stop. He sees steam rising from the hood and he fumbles outside onto the dry, arid earth. Stephen screams, kicking his car. Not now. Not in the middle of the desert. He hears footsteps from behind him and then a voice. Ken Gardner. A little trouble with your car? Ken asks Stephen. He is wearing a tattered overcoat with high top boots. Large bags hang under his eyes and his large graying hair is messy and unkempt like his scraggly beard. Stephen. Yeah, it decided to give out on me, I guess. Ken. So follow me back to my trailer. I'll get you a phone to call someone. Ken smiles through his chapped lips. Somehow Ken looks familiar to Stephen, as if he knew him from somewhere, but he can't quite put his finger on it. Don't worry, it's not too far away. Stephen. Hesitating. Well, thank you. A short hike later at Ken's small trailer, Ken points Stephen towards his phone. Stephen thanks him and picks up the receiver to dial the tow company. Ken, staring at Stephen. Hey, now, wait a minute. You're that hero, aren't you? Ken grins, his eyes full of excitement. Ken, I don't live in a cave, Mr. Cook. Stephen, have I met you before? Stephen says in an attempt to change the subject. Ken, he only smiles. Firepower, huh? That's really amazing, you know. Stephen, yeah, but I don't need it. I really don't even want it, actually. Ken, so give it to me. Stephen, scoffing. Yeah? How can I do that? Ken. Don't you know, Mr. Cook, that every gift given to you is yours to use or give away? Stephen. Stunned now. But how? Ken. Ken holds out his hand. Do you really want to be done with it? Stephen. Yes. Ken. Then take my hand. 
Stephen holds out his hand cautiously and then finally takes Ken's. Stephen watched, stunned as sparks start to resonate from their clasped hands. He feels a suction sensation and they're both thrown backwards. Stephen stares at his own hands and knows that the powers are gone. Ken. Yes, yes. Ken storms outside into the desert, his smile even wider now. He lifts his hands and on command in a brilliant flash, a shrub explodes into a flame. Yes. Stephen. I guess I should call the tow company, Stephen says with a hint of doubt. He watches the burning shrubs silently and fear begins to creep up his spine. He goes in and calls the company and comes out to watch Ken again. Stephen. They can't come and tow me until tomorrow, Mr. Gardner. I'm sorry. Ken, still trembling with excitement. Then please take my couch for the night. Stephen, are you sure? Ken, of course you've done so much for me, he says, marveling over his hands. Stephen heads off to the couch after a long day, but just before he falls asleep, he shoots straight up. Stephen, that's how I know him. He was a teacher at the school. I never got to meet him. Finally, Stephen dozes off. The next day, Stephen wakes up on the couch and calls Ken's name. It appears Ken is now gone, leaving no note or explanation. Stephen thinks nothing of it and gets ready to greet the tow truck driver. Ten minutes later, Ken is still gone and the tow truck driver arrives. Driver. What's the problem, sir? He's oil stained and looks like he hasn't showered in about six days. Stephen. I don't know. I guess you can take a look. Tow truck driver looks under the hood for a short period and approaches Stephen again. Driver. I think you can be on your way, Mr. Cook. All you need is a replacement spark plug. I may even have one in my truck. Stephen. Oh, well, thank you. How much do I owe you? Driver. Free of charge, Mr. Cook. You're a real hero. It's the least I can do. Stephen. Well, thanks again. The driver replaces the plug, gives Stephen one last wave, and heads off in a cloud of dust. Stephen gets into his car. Then Stephen drives off back onto the road, continuing away from his home. He switches on the radio out of habit and comes upon a new story already in fact. Announcer. We have helicopters live at the scene of the tragedy, giving us live updates every minute. We now go to our pilot, Gail Washington, live at Mountain Hill High School. Gail. Thanks, Bob. I'm right over at the high school now, which is only a fireball. It started a little after 11 this morning. This is the same school, I might remind you, that Mr. Cook had prevented the school shooting just three days ago. So far, police investigators are drawing the conclusion that Mr. Cook started the fire some two hours ago, but he is nowhere to be found. Hold on, Bob. I'm getting word now that a man has just walked out of the burning wreckage. As far as I know, everyone has already evacuated the building, so this is quite the mystery. I can't quite... Announcer. Is it Mr. Cook? Gale. I don't know. I see him. He's... He appears to be on fire. He's approaching the fire trucks and he's... Oh, the fire engine has just gone up in flame. The police... I can't even see them anymore. Stephen. He switches off the radio and slams on the brakes. He sits there behind the wheel, mind racing. God, what have I done? He turns the car around, facing his home, facing his destiny. It was never mine to give. He hits the gas and races down the road toward the school. Crimson Creek. Gardner stopped at a restaurant whose windows were smashed in, bloody drips cascading off, just like the running rain. Gardner carefully flung his leg over the protruding glass spikes. This would have to be his temporary shelter. Gardner was able to get inside, but his bare feet crunched down on tiny pieces of glass. Gardner leaned sideways into the restaurant's bar. After a few long minutes, Gardner saw he was alright, for now. He sat down on a stool and put his left leg in a cross over his right. On the palm of his foot were small shards of glass embedded within his calluses. He winced as he clasped his index and thumb fingers onto one shard and pulled it out. Gardner did this for a long few minutes, going on to the next foot. But it had no bad cuts, nothing that would require any stitches. Gardner spun in his chair and faced the back of the bar. He got off his stool and winced again. He left behind him a trail of bloody footprints, but he didn't care. He turned the corner of the bar, stepping into a thin puddle of blood. There in the corner, a dead body twitched noticeably. Right before Gardner's eyes, the fingernails on the dead body's hands grew and then sharpened. The bleeding pinpricks on the body's neck widened to the sizes of ping-pong balls. Gardner could see the inside of his neck, dark and rotting. The holes twitched with the body as if they were gills. Its wide and glassy eyes bulged. They became bloodshot and started to change into a yellowish color. Gardner didn't want to see this. He couldn't. All he wanted to do was jump back out the window and jog out of town before the sun finally went down, leaving this town in complete darkness. But he stayed rooted to the spot, eyes fixed on the now writhing cadaver. Now it was no longer dead. It was becoming alive again. In one last seizure, the body's mouth flew open, showing its yellow teeth. 
Its incisors were now widening, pushing the other teeth over a considerable amount to make room. Then they started to grow and sharpen, just like the nails. But they weren't turning black. They were so white that they shined in the bar's fluorescent lighting. The body then stopped twitching, and its eyes closed. It looked so peaceful. The holes on its neck were becoming regular-sized again, but took on a purplish color like a bad bruise. Gardner dodged away from the bar and away from the liquor to stand beside a pile of chairs and an overturned dining table. He stooped down behind them and watched through the gaps in the chairs. There was a rustle and then the slapping of hands in the puddle of blood. Gardner shuddered. Then feet were slipping around in it. The creature's head came into view as it stood upright. Gardner shifted upward, resting his eyes in between the edges of the table and the overturned leg of the chair. The creature looked forward with bleary eyes, with huge pupils. Gardner watched those eyes. He didn't want to, but it seemed inevitable. The pupils shrank back and the thing cracked its head to the side with a shuddering click. It proceeded to do it to the other side of the neck. Then it smiled, showing its sharp fangs. Gardner broke out in goose flesh once it sniffed the air, nostrils opening wide. It laughed darkly with a hint of anger, but it was still happy. The sun had finally set. It proceeded outside through the shattered window. Then the thing sniffed the air again, and it ran in the direction that its nose was pointing to. It disappeared out of sight. Gardner noticed that more dark figures were running down the sidewalk across the street in the same direction. He got up and walked cautiously toward the shattered window, careful not to step again on any shards of glass. The dark figures drew closer, and he could see... They were all heading in the same direction, all of them looking forward. It started off as just a few on the sidewalks, and then there were hundreds coming from everywhere. They were even crawling across the exterior walls of buildings like spiders. They moved with extraordinary pace, some jumping from building to building with perfect agility. Garner watched astonished as the evil walked in the soaking rain, grinning fiercely. The sun was down and the only light came from the bolts of electricity flashing in the sky. Some even walked by the shattered window, so close that Garner could smell the rotting skin. Garner jumped back, but no creatures noticed him or even heard his wild scream and heavy breathing. Their eyes were fixed forward at something. They were all heading toward the same spot. Garner carefully tiptoed over to where the door was. It was locked, but the key was still in the keyhole. Garner turned the key and then turned the knob. The door opened with a rusty squeak. Creatures walked past the door dangerously close, but they didn't even shoot Gardner a glance. Gardner stepped outside, feet slapping down into a small glassy puddle. He took another step into clean cement. He noticed a group of five creatures that had just walked past him, freezing in place and ready to run. He walked a few more steps out into the overrun street, his hospital gown billowing in the wind. A couple more passed by him. One woman looked to be in her thirties, holding a baby with needle teeth poking out from under its slipper lip. The baby hissed at Gardner, forked tongue flitting. The mother only clutched her baby tighter. A few more steps and he was close to the middle of the street. Gardner now noticed a lot of younger kids were running by. One skipped by with no eyes in its skull, only bleeding sockets. The boy sniffed sourly at the air and then smiled, like he knew Gardner was there. Some of the wall crawlers knocked on the windows of a few buildings. A second later, a pallid gray hand smashed through the glass of one of the windows, revealing another smiling, pale face. Six or seven of them would crawl out of each window, at a time. The creatures were now walking faster, leaping to building to building, street corner to street corner. Gardner turned sharply backwards, recognizing, for the first time, the distinctive destination of the night crawlers. The hotel, right in the center of town, was being invaded. The things were pouring in to the open entrances and into the smashed windows. A meeting, Gardner whispered to himself. The crowd was dying down and soon Gardner was standing in an empty flooding street. He watched the last few make their way into the open doorway, which shut with a large thud before running towards it. Clapping and whooping came a few seconds later and Gardner started to run faster, feet slipping across the gravel. Now a dark figure bathed in red flame stepped into view, a mask of pure hatred etched over its wrinkled skin. Gardner skidded to a stop, mouth hanging open. The burning figure stopped as abruptly as Gardner right there in the street. The clapping grew louder as if its presence was known from the occupants inside. Gardner hiccuped in fear, slipping backward. The figure turned towards Gardner, showing his true horrific beauty. It had red glowing eyes and black hair flowing away from its blood-soaked forehead. His nose creased down sharply, his mouth open in a devilish grimace. 
Long fangs poked out of its rotting gums. They were blood-stained and brown. The flames on his back and legs grew brighter and bigger. A long forked tongue rolled out, and a long hiss escaped his lips. God Almighty in Heaven, Gardner croaked. This creature screamed in anger and burst into flames. Gardner could only think to run perpendicularly away from the creature, toward the hotel. Loud cheering escalated inside as he closed the distance. He slipped in the wet grass and his head smacked onto the pavement and so did his knee. He screamed out and his cracked hands clawed at the rough pavement, scraping up his already loose skin. His knees locked, his tennis shoes kicking at the water. Gardner was losing air and you could feel the pooling water seeping out of the earth to drown him. Now the water was rushing at him, waves crashing against the entrance to the hotel. He flung his head up above the now chest-high riptide. Cars were now floating like corks, swept along the tide with Gardner. His head was thrust back down and just in time, Gardner felt himself rise up high into the heart of the rushing wave. His head spun helplessly, air running on low again. Wave crashed down and Gardner again smacked his knees on the level pavement. He screeched out in excruciating pain, oxygen discreet. He reached his hand out from the water only to grasp onto a rusty metal bar. Gardner grabbed it with his other hand and painfully pulled himself out of the roaring flood. He pulled his entire soaking and shaking body onto the platform, directly above his head. He shook off his dizzying pain and took a second to look around him. He was on the first floor fire escape of the hotel. He slapped his hand to his bleeding scalp as trickles ran down his cheek. Gardner knew that he was closing in on sleep. That's all he wanted to do, just to lay his head back and fall into slumber. Tears of pain started to course down his face, mixed with the blood. Suddenly, the water circling the embassy burst backward in one large circular wave. He grabbed the ladder beside his temple and climbed up all the way to the fourth floor, the water level quickly escalating below him to swallow up the platform he had just stood on. He pushed open one of the emergency exits and limped inside the hotel. He was inside. There was no turning back now. He walked on down a hall, full of flickering fluorescent light, until he came to the hallway's banister that looked down upon the dining area. Dead things of all shapes and sizes circled the main hall below him, all cheering. Gardner gasped, backing away steadily. It would not be good if by chance they noticed a bloody man standing on the fourth floor balcony. Gardner then recognized the figure standing amid the crowd, which was no longer burning, and it stood at a splintered pulpit. At the head of the audience, he had his arms tucked away in his gray robes, a stern face painted gravely, wearing a stern face. Gardner even thought he saw the thing glance up at him briefly. And was that a smile? Gardner gasped and dodged away from the glass banister. Hello, Gardner, he heard from behind him. He turned sharply around to look down the hallway he had just exited. A figure stood there, red eyes glaring. The figure stepped forward, revealing a slim-looking, tattered clothed, blood-stained Joseph. Gardner jumped forward but caught himself. Joseph, you okay, man? He asked. Where the hell have you been? Joseph continued to smile, and Mike noticed in the dining hall light that ripples of blood were dripping down his muzzled chin. His lips parted, revealing pinprick teeth that glimmered. Gardner knew what was about to happen. He looked back with uncertainty to the banister, directly behind him. Joseph was slowly advancing toward his friend. His smirk stretched to either ear, showing off all of his molars. Joseph, man! Not you too, Gardner cried. Joseph hissed in response. Gardner withdrew, stepping awkwardly on one of his injured ankles. He fell backward, but found his balance. He was already way too close to the glass banister. Maybe if he led Joseph away from the banister, he would be alright. From that horrific fall, anyway. Joseph started to step toward Gardner, in longer strides. Then Joseph advanced on him with a long sweep of his arms. One smashed Gardner in his face, the other struck him in a winding punch to his gut. Gardner stumbled backwards and redirected all of his weight to fall to the ground instead of against the banister. Gardner flopped down onto the floor and rolled away from his friend. Joseph attacked Gardner again, his nails scratching through his hospital gown. Gardner tried to crawl away, but Joseph reeled him back in. Gardner skidded helplessly against the carpet and let out an ear-splitting scream that echoed all across the dining hall. The hall became dead silent, and all of the creatures directed their attention to the fourth floor balcony. Joseph hissed again, forked tongue slicing through his gaping mouth. Gardner screamed, crawling towards the glass banister. Joseph attacked head on, wrestling Gardner flat onto the ground. He overwhelmed Gardner and pushed his back flat against the glass banister. His rancid breath clouded over Gardner and caused him to vomit inside his mouth. 
Joseph smiled again, and a skin flap around his eye fell open to reveal black, lifeless muscles and the beginning of Joseph's glowing eyeball. Gardner closed his eyes, his body now lifeless. Joseph had him pinned, his razor nails cutting into the muscle of Gardner's arm. But Gardner was done screaming. Joseph pulled him up but slammed him back against the glass, causing a fine crack to spread. Down below, Mike could even hear whooping coming from the audience. They were chanting for his death, but he could sense that they weren't encouraging Joseph to bite him. They didn't want to reanimate him. They wanted him as a meal, down there in the dinner hall. Joseph smashed him against the banister a second time, and Garner could hear shards of glass start to slip from the frame. After another hit, the metal railing bent and snapped. A rain of glittering glass followed Garner down as he teetered backward in the midst of his fall from the balcony. He lost his shoe and his consciousness. All he remembered seeing was Joseph's bright glowing eyes glaring down at him and his wicked grin. Gardner struck a table below him, splitting it in two. No monsters were sitting at this table, but china and silverware had been laying askew. All the rest of the glass slammed down on him in a horrible cascade of needles. The creatures backed away, all cheering. Their leader even let out a delightful whoop of glee. Gardner came to in that exact second, and he saw one steak knife descending toward his open chest, clasped in the hand of a hungry diner. He let out a moan of fear before rolling painfully off the table as the knife struck. Gardner tried to struggle to his feet, but all his nerves were floating away with the cheering of the hungry creatures. His back revealed an even larger dinner knife tagging the place between his shoulder blades, spreading with a bright wet stain. The creatures groaned disappointed as Gardner died before they could start feasting, his life force quickly diminishing, blood curdling and clotting with every dying brain cell. They did not feast, and Gardner did not regain his feet. They allowed him to die in peace, slowly clearing the dining area and following their robed master through the grand entranceway and back into the perpetual night. Tune in next time. For Three Quarters from Heaven, Parts 1 through 4. Until then, guard your soul.